Uh, and you should see it's recording. Welcome to George Mason University's Observatory. We're happy to have you here tonight for our virtual evening under the stars. You can find out more information about our observatory at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. You can follow us on Twitter at GMU Observatory or email us at gmuobservatory at gmu, oh, sorry, gmail.com. Uh, so these evenings under the stars are free and they're alternating Thursdays. Tonight is October 8th. I forgot to update this particular slide, but we will have another talk in two weeks on the 22nd. Uh, these are talks appropriate for all ages and interests, uh, and they are followed by a guided virtual telescope tour of the, tonight's sky. And we're happy to report that the weather looks great tonight, and we have opened the telescope and we'll be able to look virtually uh, through our telescope and show you some live views of a night sky. Um, I do ask that you fill out this survey uh, listed here uh, at the bottom of this page and, and how you found out about, uh, let us know how you found out about our event, any feedback or suggestions you have. I will be posting a link to that form uh, in the chat later uh, this evening. So we're located on the Fairfax campus uh, atop Research Hall, on the roof of Research Hall. And um, you can see the observatory is one of the iconic structures on, on our campus. And we have a control room uh, that's shown where, where it's located on the roof in the arrow. And there you see our dome um, on, on the roof of Research Hall. Shown around here uh, are some of the images uh, that we've taken with our campus telescope. Uh, and we'll hopefully give you some black and white version views of uh, the night sky uh, tonight. These are color images that are composed of three separate um, uh, filters, uh, but we'll, we'll still get uh, some nice black and white views of the night sky uh, tonight. Uh, we put out a monthly newsletter called The Moon. Uh, you can sign up for our, our newsletter at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. And uh, in a recent issue, we talked about uh, the recent discovery of the potential for life on in the clouds of Venus. And so you can read more about that uh, in our newsletter. And then old editions of the newsletter also archived on our website there. Uh, if you're not a student at Mason, uh, we have a program called Patrons of the Observatory um, and in order to continue to inspire excellence in astronomy here at GMU, as well as engage in educating the Washington DC community about the wonders of our universe, where we need assistance. And so we have a philanthropic organization called Patrons of the Observatory, uh, uh, which is a distinguished group of leaders and educators in the field of astronomical science. Uh, and any donations to the observatory are tax deductible. We have different uh, levels of membership. Uh, starting from star members, uh, at fifty dollars uh, to up to the Big Bang, and like to thank our Big Bang members, Galaxy members, Supernova members, as well as our new Nova cluster and star members. Uh, I'm Peter Plafchan. I'm the director of the observatory. Uh, I believe we are joined tonight by uh, Dr. Rob Parks. Uh, if if not, he'll be here at some point. He is the deputy director of the observatory. Uh, and his new faculty here. Uh, we have two observatory graduate student teaching assistants, Justin Wittrock and William Matsko, who will be leading the guided telescope tour tonight. Uh, and we have, for, if, for those of you that are students here at Mason, if you are interested and curious about the universe, we have a student club, Friends of the Observatory. Brandon Iverson is the president of the student organization and uh, you can reach out to us at gmuobservatory at gmail.com to find out more information about our student club. I'd also like to acknowledge our um, tour guides uh, for um, the observatory, Ryan, Patrick, Owen, Ashley, Victor, Brandon Toth, and Andrew. Um, so uh, once again, you could follow us on Twitter at GMU Observatory. Uh, you can email us and I will post a link to a survey about tonight's evening under the stars for you to check out later. I see some uh, students are asking about the observing report for uh, presumably um, our Astronomy 103 and 112 uh, classes. And uh, while we can't do signatures, the attendance, uh, what I will do is uh, take a screen capture of the participants. Yes, you could also take a screen capture of the, of the slides. 
uh, to uh, uh, verify that you were in attendance tonight. So it is my pleasure now to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Varjan Gorian from NASA JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory located in Pasadena, California. One of the highlights uh, as a professional scientist of the pandemic is that we can actually have um, such distinguished speakers as uh, Dr. Gorian come to us uh, virtually uh, from uh, thousands of miles away to talk about the work that they do. And Dr. Gorian's talk tonight is on black holes and his title is Black Holes Don't Suck. Uh, Varjan and I have very similar pathways through academia. We both did undergraduate degrees at Caltech, uh, both earned our PhDs at UCLA, separated by a number of years. Uh, and then uh, we both went to uh, JPL for a number of years. Um, and uh, there, um, Dr. Varjan Gorian is a JPL scientist. He actively studies uh, uh, galaxies and, will, and uh, the, the active galaxies and what uh, is at the core of them. Uh, and he is now the PI of a possible future NASA mission concept whose name I already forgot in the past uh, 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 five minutes, uh, but uh, it's a- I'll fill them in. You'll fill them in, fantastic. But it's, a, it's a, to study the hearts of, of galaxies and what they're up to. Uh, so a very timely talk, uh, I, and uh, I'll let the, our speaker tell you why. And thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Dr. Gorian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Just one minor correction. It's Gorgian, not Gorian. <laughs> uh, My apologies. Uh, no, 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 not a problem, not a problem. I'm very happy to be here. I'm always uh, happy to talk about uh, one of my passions and hopefully we'll get a little bit uh, every, uh, of passion from everybody else about this topic. So let me begin sharing my screen. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, I'll leave people with a good sense of uh, why black holes don't suck. Uh, and it's not primarily about how cool they are. I don't think there's any dispute about how cool they are. But there are many other things that I hope that people uh, will realize about them. But I think the, the way in my life uh, that I've always learned is uh, I tend to do things in a historical way. And I wanted to give people sort of the history of how we came to this idea of black holes. And so I'll just sort of go through this, hit some highlights, and then um, talk about you know, what we know about them now and what the discoveries are. And in fact, this year's Nobel Prize went for the studies of black holes. So uh, we start off with, of course, black holes have to do with gravity. So in uh, the first theory of gravity was by Sir Isaac Newton in 1687. But what's interesting is that in about 100 years afterward, uh, John Mitchell conjectured, conjectured that there might be an object that's massive enough to have an escape velocity greater than the speed of light. Now, at the time, though, uh, Newton's theory of gravity would not have affected light because the idea that he had was that the gravitational force between two objects between, depends on the mass of those two objects. Uh, and light does not have mass. Of course, at this early time, they didn't quite understand that. But, um, but if light didn't have mass, Newtonian gravity does not predict that it, there will be any kind of an effect by, of gravity on light. Uh, but still, I mean, there was this sort of in between time and in uh, 1796, uh, Laplace predicted that there, there would be in fact black holes. And he specifically said it is therefore possible that the, that the largest luminous bodies in the universe may through this cause be invisible. Um, of course, there was a lot more that needed to be to come together. And it really, it was in 1915 when Albert Einstein published his general theory of relativity that really moved away from this idea of action at a distance, that uh, gravity was this force like electromagnetism, but that gravity was the curvature of space. That is, if space is flat, that is, there's no mass there, there's nothing changing the shape of it, light will travel straight. If there's a piece, any kind of mass there, it will alter the shape. It will create a curved space. And so light traveling will have to travel in a curve and therefore gravity affects light. Very quickly after the theory was, was published, uh, Carl Schwarzschild um, uh, used the theory of relativity and in fact said you could get this very extreme situation where the escape velocity is the speed of light and 
since you can't go faster than the speed of light, therefore there could be a time when there's a radius beyond which there, no light can come out. And so that was the gravitational radius and now it's defined as the Schwarzschild radius. Um, Sir Arthur Eddington, who was more of an uh, observational astronomer but, uh, and physicist, um, he, uh, he was the one who actually mounted an expedition to go and see a solar eclipse to see whether the stars behind the sun would be affected by the gravity of the sun, which was a very clever experiment because of course you can see stars behind the sun because the sun is so bright, but during a full solar eclipse, it gets dark enough and you can actually see the stars relatively close to the sun. And there was an expectation that if the theory was correct, those stars positions would be changed because they would be, uh, their uh, paths to us as they went around the sun would be shifted because the sun was curving the space around it. And so he, he provided one of the very early solid uh, ev pieces of evidence that the general relativity was correct. But he and Einstein did not like the black hole theory at all. And also at this time, it really didn't even have a name. Then another uh, physicist, uh, Chandra Sekhar, who was a pioneer in, in the theory of white dwarfs, which is these very compact remnants of stars like our sun will become, um, he, dis he was getting closer to it set limits on what's left over after stars die. And uh, though there are various different uh, ones, options that you can have if it's a somewhat massive star, it's a white dwarf. If it's a more massive star, it's a neutron star. And if it's a more massive star still, it's a black hole. And that's what we need to talk a little bit now as to what is it that makes a black hole in the first place at all? How could you make a black hole? How could you make it so that you have enough mass in a small enough volume such that the escape velocity is the speed of light? So well, let's briefly talk a little bit about just how stars work. Stars are, in a way, very simple. They're a hot ball of gas. The gas is very massive, so gravity is pulling in in every direction. But then there's energy being generated at the center of the star, which is putting pressure outward. So the pressure is counteracting the gravity at some point, which stabilizes the size of the star. The more massive it is, of course, it has more mass that is larger, but then it, it generates, has to generate more energy to counter the gravity. So, but what happens when the pressure goes away? Oops, go back. Um, a new force of pressure is needed to basically stop the gravitational attraction. Now, if you're a star like our sun, the mass is such that if you, if the center does not produce that much energy anymore, that is, it cannot, doesn't have enough uh, lighter elements, you, we start off with hydrogen and convert them into helium to get the energy that we need, then you go to heavier and heavier elements. But at some point, you're not generating any more energy by fusing these lighter elements into heavier elements. And in fact, then the core starts collapsing, but then, it, because you're not really generating any energy at that point, and the gravity is starting to win. But there's something called electron degeneracy pressure. That is, if you pack all your atoms close enough together, and all the electrons in the sort of orbital theory of the atom. So you remember you have the protons and the neutrons at the center of an atom, you have the electrons outside of the atom. But once you pack everything close enough together, there's electron degeneracy pressure. That is, you can't pack them any closer. So that will actually stop your collapse. And that's what will happen to the end of our sun. The outer layers will get blown off. The core will no longer be able to produce energy, but the gravity will pull in, pull in, but there's not enough mass to go beyond this electron degeneracy pressure. The electrons fight back, you have that pressure, and so you have something that's left over that's about the size of the Earth. But what if you're even a more massive star uh, and you can overcome this electron degeneracy pressure? And in fact, when people have done the math, you can overcome that. And in fact, gravity and the mass just keeps pushing in on the atoms and shoves the electrons into the protons, at which point you're left with just neutrons. And, but as gravity is trying to shove all those neutrons together, you get to a state called a neutron degeneracy pressure, which will resist any of this pulling in of the gravity of whatever is left at the core of a star. Usually these are far more massive stars. They go through a supernova, that is, it's an explosion. And you would think that the explosion would blow everything apart, but the explosion actually comes in the outer layers and the inner core actually gets compressed and gravity is pulling in. 
eventually you get neutron de degeneracy pressure taking over and that halts the collapse. And you get something about, you know, the size of the city of Los Angeles or any larger cities, you know, multiple miles wide, but that's about it. So the neutron degeneracy pressure fights against the gravity and it no longer collapses and you have this remnant called a neutron star. But the next one is, what if your mass is way more than that? What if your mass is such that it goes beyond the ability of neutron degeneracy pressure to prevent it from collapsing? There isn't anything else. We haven't come up with anything else that can resist that pull of gravity. So there's nothing we know of, which means gravity wins. And you end up just collapsing and collapsing and collapsing forever into a volume basically that's essentially zero. So that's how you get a black hole. That is, you have to have enough mass that's compressed into a small enough volume such that the escape velocity becomes the speed of light. So, but notice all that's changed is the size of the source. You haven't actually added any more mass. You haven't fundamentally altered anything else. In fact, during the supernova, a good bit amount of the mass actually gets blown off. It's only the core that keeps collapsing such that if a star is massive enough and it has a massive enough core, it will overcome the neutron degeneracy pressure and become a black hole. But you haven't really changed anything else. And this is why I'm saying black holes don't suck. That is, fundamentally, their environment is not changed in a way. Uh, once a black hole, you know, there's a lot of mass, except it's a very small volume, which means you can get very close to it. And that's one of the things that gives you some of the very strange effects that you would have heard about it. But it basically gets small enough so that you can get close enough to all of that mass. So I'll, I'll speak about a couple of analogies here just to get you a sense of why, what is it about black holes that's actually not that unusual. If we had a magical way of changing our sun into a black hole. Now, again, our sun isn't massive enough to become a black hole on its own, but if we could have some external way of compressing it into a small enough volume so that it becomes a black hole, a one solar mass black hole, what would happen to our solar system? Would Mercury just sort of suddenly get sucked in and fall into it, th that new black hole? No, Mercury right now is orbiting a one solar's mass worth of gravity in the sun. Now, if you make it a lot smaller, it's still one solar mass worth of gravity that Mercury is orbiting. Same with the Venus, Earth, and all the other planets and everything else that's orbiting the sun. Of course, it would be very dark and cold, so that's, I'm not recommending that we ever have that happen, even if, you know, if we could magically turn the sun into a one solar mass black hole. But I just want you to get a sense that the idea of the black hole is a lot of mass in a very small volume. And that's how gravity works. The closer you are to a mass, the more the gravitational pull you feel. The further away you are, the less you feel. The more massive something is, the more gravitational pull it'll have. The less massive it is, the, the less pull it'll have. So for example, for the Earth, you know, if you're very, very far from the Earth, you don't need much to escape the gravity of the Earth. So that's easy. But if you're closer to the Earth, you actually need to put in you know, a lot of effort to get away from the Earth. That's why we need powerful rockets to lift us away from the gravity of the Earth. But what if you could get closer to all the mass of the Earth? And I don't mean like, let's start digging towards the center of the Earth, because if you start digging, you're actually leaving a lot of that mass behind you. That's you know, on top of you. And that mass is actually pulling you away from the center of the Earth. So it actually counteracts it. And if you could get to magically the exact center of the Earth, you'd essentially be weightless because all the gravity of the Earth more or less cancels out. Earth is not exactly spherical. If it would be spherical, it'd be perfectly canceled out. But the idea is the pull of the gravity that you feel, it's all the mass that's underneath your feet. And if you comp start compressing the Earth such that you're getting closer to all of that mass, that the mass is becoming smaller, that makes it so that possible to feel this greater gravity, greater pull of gravity. So that's the critical thing to think about. In many ways, in, in that way in particular, black holes are not that exotic. It's just a lot more mass and a smaller volume, but everything orbits them. So let's um, 
push forward a little bit beyond what Chandrasekhar was talking about, what are the things that could stop the collapse? Uh, and John Wheeler coined the term black hole actually in 64. Before then, there, were, there was no real commonly used term. In 1964, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, in fact, discovered neutron stars. At, at the time, they weren't even sure that neutron stars were real. Uh, but then her discovery showed that you were getting this situation where a lot of mass was being compressed into a small enough volume, in this case, still stopped by neutron degeneracy pressure. But it was, we were getting closer to this idea. And in 1965, Roger Penrose, who just won the Nobel Prize uh, this year, uh, in the words of another Nobel Prize winner, Kip Thorne, who won a Nobel Prize, again, for works on uh, black holes and gravity in, um, in 2017, he said he revolutionized the mathematical tools we use to analyze the properties of space-time. And he showed when a collapse would pass the point of no return. So now the theoretical work is catching up to really describe how this you know, compression and the escape velocity becoming the speed of light is working out. And then 1970, Stephen Hawking defined sort of the modern theory of black holes, merging it with, not completely, but getting a connection between the other aspect of physics, which is the physics of the very small quantum mechanics. But then that actually defines the final fate of black holes. But notice nobody had ever done any kind of observations or anything that would lead you to think that there was such a thing that it would exist. But in 1970, Cygnus X1 became the very first good black hole candidate. It was labeled X1 because it was the first X-ray source detector, detected in the constellation of Cygnus. And in fact, it's actually a regular star, except the X-rays shouldn't have been coming from the star, but the star was a binary. It was coming from its companion. And so what it turns out was happening is that the star and this other object were orbiting each other. And material from the star was falling onto this compact object near it. But because it's a binary system, you can actually figure out the mass of the companion. And the mass of the companion was, I think, about 14 times the mass of our sun, 14 solar masses, which meant that, that was far beyond any theory. That was beyond the neutron gen degeneracy pressure that could stop it. And so this was a really great candidate. Suddenly, there was actual observational evidence that there could be black holes out there. Now, we'll backtrack a little bit, go back to the beginning of the 20th century, because there was a completely, on a completely separate track, there was a completely separate mystery that had been brewing. As people were looking at galaxies, these are you know, hundreds of billions of stars, like our Milky Way galaxy. At the time, they didn't even, didn't even know there were such things as galaxies. but they, um, some of the galaxies were putting out more light um, than you would expect from their centers. And this is the, in, in particular, both uh, regular light and what's called, you know, like continuum light, but also, don't worry about the spectra here, I'll just give you a quick sense of what we're looking at. Fundamentally, what they were doing is they were breaking the light that we're getting from these galaxies and breaking them up into their components, which is exactly what a rainbow is. You have sunlight, which is white, you break it apart and it has multiple colors. In the lower left, this is what a galaxy looks like. Uh, on the left side, uh, around 4,000 angstroms is the bluer light, on the right side is the redder light, and you can see the kind of light that we get from a galaxy is a combination of all the stars that are in it and has a lot of little dips, but fundamentally, no big spikes. That's what we call an emission light. But what Fath noticed was that there were a whole bunch of stars that, A, first were putting out a lot more light from their centers than the sum of the stars would make you expect. And then there were these emission lines. That is, these emission lines are like basically a little bit like neon lights. It's, it's, it's a hallmark that there's a lot of very hot gas. So people didn't know why these galaxies were putting out this extra light and very hot gas at their centers. And then in 1943, Carl Seifert really was doing the measurements and was like, yeah, they're, they're putting, these objects are putting out way more light than the sum of the stars at their centers. And then in 1959, radio astronomy came about. Remember, you know, astronomy is just collecting light and you can collect light in the wavelengths that your eyes can see or in the wavelengths that your eyes can see, you know, like X-rays, which was how Cygnus X1 was discovered, or radio waves. And they were noticing that there was a lot of powerful radio emission coming from um, what looked like stars. 
And in fact, by 1962, uh, there were a whole bunch of sources that were very powerful radio emitters, but they looked like stars. That is, it was in an optical image looking in the wavelengths that your eyes can see, they look like stars. And stars really aren't that powerful of a radio emitter. And so these were called quasi-stellar radio sources or quasars for short. They're quasi-stellar in the sense that, you know, they look like stars, but they sure as heck don't, you know, behave like stars. And then it's a very interesting sort of odd coincidence in that in the 1960s in Armenia, there was uh, an astronomer who had established an observatory there named Viktor Helmartsumyan, and his student, Benjamin Markarian, started looking at a lot of these extragalactic objects, looking for stuff that would be putting out extra blue light. Blue light is usually an indication that there's something energetic is going on. As, you know, there's, if you're like your gas stove, if the flame is blue, that gas is very hot. You know, flames that are redder that are less hot. So they're looking for very energetic things. And at the time, the Soviet Union had a scientist exchange program. So uh, the Armenia was a part of the Soviet Union then, and they sent over one of Benjamin's students, Edward Khachikian, and he came and worked with an American astronomer named Dan Weedman. And they started looking at these very blue objects that had been discovered. And it turned out they were the same kinds of galaxies that Seifert had seen, which are a lot of extra, extra light coming from their center and very hot light. They had these emission lines. So the state of play in the 70s, as far as the galaxies were concerned, was there's a large number of galaxies that have radio emission. Okay, that's uh, that was weird to begin with. And then there was a lot of radio emission coming from these quasars, which they had finally figured out that they're very far away, which meant that mu they must be very luminous. So it was just a very, very luminous object to be, for you to be able to see it. Or else, you know, if, if you're not very luminous, you know, the further you go, the dimmer you get. But the fact that we were seeing these very luminous objects very far away meant that, you know, there was a lot of energy coming out of them. And then large numbers of these Seifert galaxies from the Markarian catalog had a lot of UV and sort of blue light excess. And then as they were monitoring these quasars, they were noticing that they're variable. So what are, you know, what could be generating all of this, all of these different phenomena? Everything was sort of seemed unconnected until people started thinking, no, they're actually all powered by the same thing. Uh, well, they were actually trying to figure out how they could power it with the same thing. First, people said, well, we know stars generate a lot of energy. We know young stars are hot. Let's just put a ton of stars. These are star forming galaxies that have a ton of stars at their centers. The problem is that the variability didn't work. If you have a ton of stars, those thousands of stars can't vary in unison. Either some are gonna get brighter, some are gonna get dimmer. So on average, you know, it's gonna wash out. And also if you pack that many stars together, they're actually just gonna start tidally disrupting each other and then throwing them out. And young stars, which you needed to be luminous, tend to, you know, tend to explode. And so you'd have a lot of supernova explosions and the kinds of variability we were seeing were not supernova explosions. And so people just kept trying to figure out how to generate all of this energy. So fusion was one way that they could do it, which is what powers stars, but you could, they couldn't make it work. So then they had to go something else. And this was finally uh, where the solution came from. And nobody was thrilled about it because this was, they were cornered into this. But the idea was that what about the release of gravitational potential energy? What does that mean? Well, if you've dropped a hammer on your toe or anything else that's, <laughs> that has some weight on your toe, you have experienced the release of gravitational potential energy. That is, you know, we're in the field of gravity of the earth, you drop something. Of course, if you drop the hammer from you know, half an inch above your toe, it's not gonna hurt. There's not much acceleration. But if you drop it from your waist, then there's a lot more acceleration. And if somebody drops it from the top of a ladder, wow, that's going to hurt. That is, the farther you are accelerated through this gravitational potential, gravitational field, the more release of energy. There's more energy to be released. And what are black holes? But a lot of mass, but in a very compact space, which means if you're falling onto a black hole, you have a long way to fall and there'll be a large gravitational potential energy release. Now, there's no surface to hit, so it's not the surface that's being hit, but as gas falls in, it's, orb it's basically spiraling into the black hole. Again, it's not being sucked in, but it's losing gravitational potential energy as, with, as friction by itself, as you can see in this image, this artist concept, 
and that heats up the gas, that energy, there, its orbital energy is being released and the stuff is falling in. But also there's a magnetic field that forms and you can set, start these jets of particles that shoot out from both poles of the accreting black hole. And those are the jets that make up in particular the radio waves that we see. So suddenly in one fell swoop, by invoking this thing that nobody particularly cared for, nobody really wanted, Einstein had his, his theory predicted it, but he wasn't too thrilled about that idea, was solving a major problem, both in extragalactic astronomy, looking at these galaxies, what are now called active galactic nuclei, as well as something like Cygnus X1, where there's a companion to a star and that gas is falling onto the companion, releasing excess energy as it falls in, and therefore it produces, it becomes very hot and emits all of these very shorter wavelength blue light, and in fact, all the way out to X-ray emitting, uh, uh, X-ray emission. So suddenly, all of this comes together for near, you know, hundreds of years of theoretical thinking, and then about a hundred, nearly 70 years of observational things that were not matching up come together if you say that, yes, this is material falling onto a black hole. And so this is, for example, Centaurus A. This is an actual galaxy. And you can see in x-rays, there's you know, very bright center. There's a, a jet you can actually see in the x-ray. You can see the jet also in, the, in radio waves. Uh, the galaxy itself, there's, you know, most of the center is blocked, so you're not seeing that. Uh, as much, but so this is a this is a way that we have a sense of oh my god, there's likely a black hole at the center of this galaxy. And here's some more of radio jets that come from other sources, so they can be very usually they're straight, but then if there's if they're in a cluster, there's actually a wind that they can be going through, and it can bend uh, the radio jets that are being emitted. So still, so why study black holes in this case, uh, particularly for extragalactic purposes? Well, they may be the seeds of galaxy formation. And uh, also, I mean, we want to know how much energy is being generated in the universe. And it, it's unknown how much active galactic nuclei contribute to the energy generated throughout the history of the universe. Because we know there's particularly earlier in the universe, active galactic nuclei were far more active. There were a lot more quasars than there are today. So that's clearly some sort of an evolutionary phase that uh, galaxies go through. And also, Quasars are some of the most distant objects that can be observed. So they're really useful markers of the very distant universe. But if, the, if black holes are in fact the seeds of galaxy formation, well, we live in a galaxy. Does our uh, galaxy have a black hole that, that seeded it? Well, that's an interesting question. Well, first of all, this is our view of the Milky Way. So we live in what's called a spiral galaxy or a disk galaxy. And we're in the disk or in the spiral arms of the galaxy. There's a bulge at the center, but you can't see it because we're in the disk and there's a lot of dust in along the way. So in the optical, you can't see much towards the center of the galaxy. But if you look at the infrared, and this is an image from the Spitzer Space Telescope, you can infrared penetrates dust. So we can actually have a great view towards the center of the galaxy. But the problem is understanding what's going on in the center is sort of difficult because there's a lot of stars at the center of the galaxy and in the bulge of the galaxy. And if you're trying to figure out what's going on on its very, very small scale, it's very hard to pick out individual stars. And uh, Andrea Guez, who actually started as a professor at UCLA uh, after a couple of years after I was an under, started as an undergraduate there, she came to UCLA and started using the Keck telescope to start monitoring the center of the galaxy to see what the stars were doing and whether you know how uh, whether you could study the black hole presumably at the center of our galaxy and then understand more about the black hole. Now this was interestingly uh, and she just this was days ago was named as uh, one of the winners of the Nobel Prize for uh, Physics for 2020. Sharing in the Nobel Prize was Reinhard Genzel, who uh, led the similar effort out of Germany using the European uh, Southern Observatory's very large telescopes in uh, South America. And this was great because both of their efforts were basically checks on each other. And of course, if, if you remember, I mentioned the third winner of this trio uh, having contributing to understanding of black holes uh, was Roger Penrose, who had done the theoretical work to show that this, this could and he actually changed the mathematics approach of how to do it and made it much more plausible and possible. But for both uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez, 
it, you know, they had the same problem. How do you pick out individual stars? And this was the development of new technology called uh, adaptive optics. That is not only, uh, the, we have two problems. First of all, that the center of the galaxy is very crowded. So if you want better resolution for your telescope, you need bigger telescopes. And in the 90s, we were getting eight and 10 meter class telescopes. That's around 400 inches across. But those are still underneath the atmosphere of the Earth, which is, you know, atmosphere is great for breathing, not so much to look through when you're trying to look at fine detail. But then there are different ways that they came up with to take out that atmospheric blurring. And here's a way of showing you where the adaptive optics are off. It's a blur at the center. Well, once you turn the adaptive optics on, you can actually see the individual stars and follow them in their orbits. And uh, again, unfortunately, animations I know don't come through very well, but this is truly one of the, uh, an amazing animation. And I would say, you know, seek out, uh, go to the UCLA Galactic Center group to see it on your own computer. But here I'll try and play it to see how well you can see it. But here, using adaptive optics so that they could, Andrea could get the individual stars and follow them, the star marks where the galactic center is and where we think the supermassive black hole is. And starting, if you look at the uh, upper right, those are dates. Those are actual observation dates all the way up till nearly 2019. So what you're seeing here, starting in 19 1995, are objects that are orbiting something that's really emitting no light. There's actually some light that actually comes out of it, but there's nothing like the very bright quasars that are there. And we've followed the orbits of these objects. And again, remember, if you, if you have two objects that are in orbit around each other, you can get the masses of each of those objects. And that's, let me show you one more time. And again, for example, see how these objects are basically, how much it changes their orbits. And that mass is about 4 million times the mass of our sun. And in fact, there's radio emission that comes from it, but very little at other wavelengths. And there are some flares that we get in both in x-rays and the infrared. So there's something that fall, you know, basically falls into it, so it generates some energy. But most of the time, it's actually very dark. It is not generating much energy. I mean, it's there. The gravity is there. It alters the orbits of the other, of the stars near there. And again, black hole, this black hole doesn't suck in any of the nearby stars. It's not a vacuum cleaner. It, things orbit it. As long as you have orbital motion, it will change your orbit. It will redirect you. The gravity will redirect you, but it will not be uh, sucking you in. So this has been one of the greatest successes in, in sort of really using uh, these secondary techniques to see where a black hole is and uh, understand its properties. And we've ma managed to do other techniques that also are telling us uh, the, the masses in other nearby black holes. And those are other techniques, particularly the ones that the mission that um, Peter was mentioning before, I am working on a smaller telescope that will monitor nearby Seaford galaxies so that we will see based on the changes in the accretion disk, changes in the brightness of the disk of material that's falling in to understand how that disk is, what the shape of the disk is, and understand more about the black hole and its environment. But also there are techniques called, this is called reverberation mapping. This is sometimes called echo mapping, not quite correct, but that's a way of sort of thinking about it as there are flares near the black hole at the center and they travel outward and they brighten up the disk. And those changes tell you how big the disk is, or in fact, how big those fast moving gas, gases are. And you can use that, the velocity of the fast moving gases. And then by figuring out how far away they are, you can figure out uh, the mass of the black hole. And we have for many, many black holes, the masses of them in nearby galaxies. But then there's even newer evidence for black holes. And this is uh, called the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, an approach that was predict started in the early 70s, even though it's actually part of a, the prediction of general relativity, that is gravity travels out in waves. We've never managed, we had never managed to detect gravitational waves, 
we always are very familiar with other kinds of waves like sound waves or electromagnetic waves, which is light. And I wanted to sort of really describe this, but there's a great series called Minute Physics. And I would highly recommend you going um, to seek it out. And I will play their description of what gravitational waves are because it does such a great job. So this will, it's not quite a minute, it's a little longer than a minute, but it's a very good series and a very good description in this case. When things move, they create so that's a little bit old. We have now detected in, uh, neutron star collisions as well. And when things move. And in fact, it was in 2017, uh, these two uh, detectors, one in Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, uh, Mississippi, uh, or Louisiana, sorry. Um, Fundamentally, we detected the uh, that that change in gravity in the gravitational wave passing through. And notice that as the gravitational wave is passing through, it does not arrive simultaneously. One of the reasons you need two, and now there's a third one with the Europeans called Virgo. Uh, that separation gives you a sense of that you do the signal that is the same signal. That is, you can't get them simultaneously. You, what you're going to get is one is going to detect it first and the other one is going to detect it next. And this was, in fact, what was detected and what got the Nobel Prize in Physics um, in 2017. So, and in fact, since then, we have detected multiple new mergers of black holes and neutron stars. So this is an entirely new way of seeing them. But this is one of those things. But it is still, in a way, it's a not that this is a bad way, but it's a secondary way. That is, we're seeing the effects of black holes either on gas falling into them or on how they modify space-time. But what about actually seeing a black hole? Can we ever do that? Well, that was yet another one of the greatest successes in recent years in that we have known about this uh, multiple galaxies nearby that do have these jets. Usually they were the radio jets, but the galaxy M87, again, is one of these that put, puts out excess energy from its center, and it has a radio jet, and in fact, it has an optical and x-ray jet, so it's a very powerful jet. So everybody knew that most likely there was a black hole there, and in fact, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope looked at the center and saw very fast-moving gas. This is not quite the accretion disk, but it is very fast. This is gas moving, orbiting at the center, and basically, again, you're, you've got the gas orbiting, something, you know, what's the velocity of the gas that depends on what it's orbiting. And in fact, they found out that in fact, this is a very, it's a supermassive black hole. And then a few years ago, actually over a decade ago, there was an, a consortium that was put together to try and image the black hole itself. How are you going to get an image of the black hole? Well, remember then when I was saying that we needed to look at the black hole at the center of our galaxy, we needed better resolution. You know, despite, you know, forgetting just about the atmospheric blurring, you still need better resolution. And to get a better resolution, you need a be bigger telescope. That's what you get. Bigger telescopes give you better resolution. That is more detail. So they decided to link up, and this was a technique that had been pioneered for many, many years already, but they decided to link up telescopes all across the Earth, such that you were getting a telescope effectively the size of the Earth, or at least had the resolution of a telescope the size of the Earth. And they pointed it at the center of M87. And this is what they saw. It's a radio image of the black hole at the center of the galaxy M87. We see the gas that's very hot that's falling in near the event horizon, but notice that it's dark at the center. There's nothing bright there. So this is direct evidence now that black holes exist and fundamentally uh, all of that theoretical work, all of the observational work, all of these technological advances have all come together and now all of those mysteries that seem to make no sense whatsoever and even the theoreticians who didn't care for this theory at all, all of that has been overcome with both you know, amazing observations to get a sense of how black holes affect their environment. And then now we actually have a direct image of a black hole. So in this case, I will say black holes don't suck because they're cool, they're amazing. And they are a key aspect of how galaxies evolve. They're a key aspect of 
how stars die, and we don't know what else there's to yet learn about this, but it is a fundamentally, you know, both a mysterious and exciting thing about the universe. So I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you, Varjan. All right, so if you have questions for our speaker tonight, please post them in the chat. Um, and I see we already have a number of questions. We're gonna go through as many of them as we can. There are some questions about the plan for tonight. Apologies, I did not clearly communicate that. Um, we are gonna have a Q&A session and then we're gonna have a virtual telescope tour. Uh, and we, we do plan to finish by around 10 p.m. Uh, so once again, there's a, a place, if you have questions for the speaker, we'll, we'll ask them uh, in, the, in, the, in the chat. Okay, so our first question It's going through, we've had a lot of chats here. Uh, uh, it comes from Unrun, Unrun K. Uh, Since the universe is expanding, will we be able to observe quasars in the future? Is there a time limit to when our observations of them will cease? I like that question. The, that's actually a long time, but that is correct. In fact, this is a real, little bit of a um, uh, strange thing to think about, but at some point, very, very, very far into the future, uh, whoever is, are the inhabitants of the Milky Way at that point, when they look out, they will see nothing. Uh, the remnant heat of the universe will, will have become too cold to be detected. All the objects as, as they're you know, fl flying away from each other, their light will be redshifted such that it'll be you know, too faint to see and they're also physically too faint to see. Now our local group will be the same. That is, you know, we're not, Andromeda will have merged with the Milky Way, but there's you know, some number of galaxies. But what's interesting is that to, the question to ask is at that point, those people will think that they are the entire universe because there's nothing else to see. And observationally, they would be correct. Um, but that is the case. That is, as the universe expands, things get further, which means things get fainter. Uh, but also as, the, as you get further away, you accelerate, which means your light gets redshifted, which means you know, it's weaker, it gets weaker and weaker in terms of energy. So it's, it's not a very pleasant thought, but it is, it is where the universe will be headed as far as we can tell. Yeah, I think there was a recent book by Katie Mack uh, about the heat death of the universe. I think, is that right? Uh, I might be wrong about that, but there's there's a popular book that came out on that. That's 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 wonderful. I could listen to all that all day. It kind of reminds me of the time we used to work together and I miss, uh, miss those conversations uh, back at JPL. All right, our next question um, uh, is uh, from Matt Nowinski. Black holes don't suck, but do they blow? Roger... <laughs> Right, well, there's a two part, two part. The second part is Roger Penrose has been talking a lot about Hawking radiation. What is it? Okay, so first, hi Matt. He's a, a quite, uh, someone that I've worked with. He's a great guy, a uh, friend of mine. And uh, uh, yeah, so this was a critical thing that Hawking brought about. And general relativity is the theory of the big. That is, gravity works on very, very large scales. You know, you don't worry about the gravity of a car that's passing you on the highway. That is, the gravity between two cars is negligible. Gravity works on big things, but on large scales. Uh, but the other theory of, within physics, which is fundamental, is quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is the theory of the small. How do atoms and protons and electrons and all of those interact? And what does, how does that, you know, eventually lead up to the larger scales that we uh, experience. And in fact, that's the dominant, you know, so at our scale, actually, those are two fairly dominant forces. That is, we, we're big enough that gravity, you know, holds us onto the earth. But the reason that your hand doesn't go through the table when you press on it is really quantum mechanics, because the electrons in your, it's an electromagnetic force. So uh, your the electrons in the table are repelling the electrons in your hand. It's not because there's, your, your hand is so closely packed with uh, objects uh, with uh, protons that they can't go through. It's not. It's actually an electromagnetic interaction. But the question was, when people looked at this, fundamentally, quantum mechanics works on particles. It's either photons or, you know, or uh, electrons or, you know, W particles, Z particles, and so on. There's a whole slew of particles which carry the forces that we're talking about. Gravity, as far as we can tell, at least within general relativity, is not a force that's carried by particles. 
that's weird. I mean, we were kept seeing, you know, oh, it's this curvature of space. But people have now tried to reformulate gravity as a particle-based one, uh, when where gravitons carry gravity. But in reality, general relativity works very well without it. But how could you make the two merge? Oh, wait, what's a black hole? Is when you take a lot of matter and you stuff it into a small volume. So suddenly there's so much mass on a small scale that gravity begins to matter on the small scale. How now both of those theories have to talk to each other, have to be connected. And the first sort of breakthrough was when Stephen Hawking said, well, how is, you know, how are, how do black holes, will they emit anything? And the idea is, well, just escape velocity is the speed of light. You can't do that. But there's a fundamental theory in uh, an aspect of quantum mechanics, which is the uncertainty principle. That is, there's certain things at a small enough scale, things are uncertain to the point that you can't know the position or the velocity or the energy versus the time that something occurs. But fundamentally, if you don't know the position and the velocity, oh, what happens at the center of a black hole? It's a singularity. The position should be perfectly well determined. Oh, wait, if your position is perfectly well determined, your momentum, your velocity is uncertain to a high, high degree, which means particles should be escaping um, black holes. And that's the concept of Hawking radiation. It's not just photons, it's actually particles. Because of the uncertainty principle, black holes actually emit particles, not on a large scale, very slowly, but they do emit it. But that means energy must be coming out of the black hole. So talking about the very, very far, far futures, black holes actually evaporate. So they do blow, except very, 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 very slowly. Uh, but that's why Hawking is famous, but also fundamentally, it, black holes bring these two very disparate parts of physics together and figuring out that connection when one is a particle-based one and one is just space curvature kind of thing has been very difficult. And if anybody can really connect those two to in the way where you know it solves this whole uh, dichotomy, then you buy yourself a ticket to Stockholm. There. Um, so, all right, that's that's a, that's a, got me thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah, sorry that was a long answer, but it's it's it, it's an interesting question. I think. Yeah, I, I just got tenure, so I'm thinking. You know, hey, I could I could think about some. <laughs> you know, but no, it's, uh, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, but that, that's, that's, that's wonderful, that's fascinating. All right, so the next question, um, how big is the biggest black hole? It comes from Caitlin Kiltz. So um, the most massive black hole that we know of, I think is the supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy, which is I think close to a trillion times the mass of our sun. Uh, and so, by the way, hey, Caitlin. So, um, and uh, yeah, it, but that doesn't mean that's that's just the one that we've managed to get the mass for. There's, as far as we can tell, there's not necessarily any limit to the how massive the central that black hole of a galaxy could be. They tend to grow by merging. That is, eventually, within clusters of galaxies, they actually lose energy as they orbit each other, and they can merge. And so then their black holes at their centers merge and they become larger and larger. So it could get larger, but I think we're close to a trillion times the mass of our sun is the one. It's 10 to the 12th. Yeah, that is just hard to imagine. A trillion yeah. times the mass of our sun. Now, I, I, you know, that sounds like a big number, but then I think about the sun. Yeah. The sun, <laughs> the sun is 300,000 times the mass of the earth, yeah. the entire planet. And now you're talking about something that's hundred trillion times uh, more massive than that. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, that's, that's a, that's uh, I'm speechless. Okay. Our next question comes from Drew. Um, we're going to take a few more questions and we're going to transition to our telescope tour for tonight. And our speaker can stick around for the, the start of that. Um, uh, it comes from uh, Umren K. Uh, what is the difference between LIGO and LISA? Ah, okay. So LIGO, which we're talking about, and um, are these two sort of detectors that, again, they're bouncing light between mirrors. One is, uh, you know, in, in two, we have them separated in two parts of the United States because that's what you want. You want if the, you know, if the gravitational wave is coming from one direction, you want one to react to it, and then the next one to react to it. That gets you a sense of when 
where the location is. And in fact, you have three of them and the Europeans have one in Europe. Now we can triangulate literally where the gravitational wave is coming from. But the wavelengths of you know, how big you can physically build these uh, things is limited on Earth because there's only so big you can actually build something uh, and then dampen the vibrations. In fact, the laser light so that it doesn't get dampened is the arms of those detectors when they're bouncing the light between those mirrors, they're actually evacuated, they're vacuums. So there's only so big of a vacuum you can create on Earth um, without you know, cost-wise. Um, that is, how many dollars are you willing to spend for this? But if you go to LISA, which is the Laser Interferometry Space Antenna, then you can actually have your mirrors as far apart or more or less as far apart as you want. So then you are sensitive to a different set of wavelengths of gravitational waves. And so then you're looking at a different set of phenomena. And so that's why being in space and being on the ground, you get sort of two different things that you can detect uh, in terms of gravitational waves. Yeah, I just, uh, it's amazing how um, the, the LIGO has opened up a, a new era in multi-messenger astronomy, as they call it. And uh, uh, Yeah, it's, it's the, the, my, my favorite analogy that's come of it is because, you know, sound is the vibration of air coming to our ears, and we don't confuse it with light when you're looking at a screen. But that's really what's sort of happening is that we've only been looking at the universe and now we're looking and listening at the universe and so, because there are fundamentally different ways of it. And one is in fact really just, you know, waves in space, much like sound is waves. So it's a very different now. Now it's, it's, it's both, you know, sound and video. <laughs> yeah, the silent movie era is over. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, some of our, uh, Anyway, if, if you're a student in an audience, there was a time when videos didn't have sound to them. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. They're on films. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, also, uh, uh, we'll, take, um, we'll take one more question and we'll transition to the telescope tour. Um, we'll take this uh, kind of a, a fun little speculative conversation uh, question. I'll wrap it into um, uh, a, a, a second question. Uh, do you believe that there is a separate universe inside on the other side of a black hole? Uh, there could be something more that we don't know due to how much of the weight mass it has. Hawking talked about the possibility of a parallel universe, but for that to be possible, then there has to be some something like a black hole covering for it. Um, and relatedly, is, is Hawking radiation how the universe will die um, as a sea of particles? Well, that's, that's a lot to unpack there, but yeah, it's a good question. The, so really what, um, when we talk about the singularity at the center of a black hole, um, that really is telling us uh, that we don't understand what's going on there. Whenever you have, you know, essentially mass in a zero volume, that's a nonsensical statement. So that tells us that our physics is incomplete. What is going on there is actually very, very difficult to understand because actually there, there's even more weird things that happen when you're talking about, you know, passing the event horizon of a black hole. In fact, um, so Einstein had predicted this idea of, I mean, not predicted, I mean, the way general relativity works is it combines space with time. That's why we call it space time. Uh, but as you go faster and faster, and closer to the speed of light, how time passes for you changes. In fact, once you pass the event horizon of a black hole, those actually replace each other such that if you move physically, now you're actually changing time. And in fact, there's no way, just like we can't stop time from passing, but I can stand in one place, inside the event horizon of a black hole, you can't you can move through, you can uh, stop time, but you can't, you, you can't physically stop your physical motion anymore. So again, very weird things are happening, but at the end of the day, whether that leads to some sort of a separate universe becomes very difficult for us to even speculate about, particularly because what I was mentioning about before is that you're really in the realm of trying to combine quantum mechanics and general relativity, which not having done that, we can't really explain what's going on beyond the event horizon. But 
it is likely that, you know, at the end of, you know, black holes will be the last things that will remain in the universe as stars die and so on. Again, they're not sucking up everything, but at some point, you know, they're, they're the ones that slowly evaporate the slowest. And in fact, th those are likely the last things that will remain as particles come off of the Hawking radiation comes off of them. But, you know, how, what, what, what it will be, again, I highly encourage people to, if you're interested in this, follow it up, study it, and then tell us what the answer is. Yeah, I, you know, I think as a fundamental principle as a scientist, I think we are more than okay saying that we don't know the answer to something. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is definitely something that we don't know the answer to. And believe me, I mean, I'm not a theoretician, I'm an observer, and so, you know, I'm observing the gas falling into supermassive black holes, but this is a really, really, highly debated topic within the black hole theory community. There's severe disagreements about what's going on at the event horizon, past the event horizon, and so on. So this is not like something that's been set aside. This is really fundamental in understanding how black holes work and people are not agreeing. There's some real interesting debates going on right now. Yeah, I, I think that's a fundamental principle of science is that um, we ask questions and sometimes we find the answers, but oftentimes it just leads to more questions. And yeah. that's actually perfectly okay. If I, um, I, I know there's no quote, uh, you know, I'd rather have uh, questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. Um, and uh, I think uh, that's, a, that's a good one. So that's a great time now to turn over to our students for our virtual telescope tour. And um, we're now going to turn it over to them and we'll take a look at our night sky here in Fairfax, Virginia. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter. And thank you, Dr. Gorgian. I really enjoyed the talk and I hope everyone else did too. So as Peter said, we'll be going uh, to transfer to the virtual uh, tour part of this uh, talk. So it's thankfully a clear night tonight. So we're gonna be able to look at a few objects. And uh, let me go ahead and share my screen right quick. And I will uh, explain uh, what we are taking a look at. So uh, right now, we're just staring at a uh, blank desktop with a lot of icons. And right now, uh, I am remotely connected to one of the computers uh, on, uh, on Fairfax campus at the top of Research Hall. So. Uh, since the start of this pandemic, we've been able to operate uh, the telescope uh, remotely, thankfully, from the comfort of our own homes. And of course, that has its uh, perks uh, and downsides. It's a little bit easier to fall asleep when you're observing at 4 a.m. But uh, one of the things that uh, makes it uh, possible to uh, remotely observe uh, safely is a series of webcams that we have uh, on the roof of Research Hall, which I'll pull up and show you now. So uh, let me go ahead and talk about uh, each of these views uh, one by one. So in the top right, let's zoom in on that. This is the control room. So if you are a student who's doing uh, research observing, this is the small room you will uh, spend uh, most of the night in. So we have two computers uh, in the room. So one uh, in the middle leftish uh, corner. Uh, so that's the one we're currently connected to now. That's the main computer we use. We can steer the telescope, operate the telescope, uh, take pictures, uh, all using that one computer. And then we have a second computer uh, just below that. And that is in theory, a clone of the main computer where we do all of our software testing. Uh, it's good uh, to have a, a backup to test all of our software and updates. Uh, a few months ago, we actually had a Windows 10 update uh, completely break our observatory and we couldn't uh, do uh, much with our telescope uh, for I think a couple months uh, before it was patched. So that is the control room. And if we go out, uh, we see uh, a no signal. That camera is in a box currently, so we don't expect anything there. And then in the bottom left, we have an outside view of our uh, roof and dome. So for a bit of a size reference, uh, that door frame is about six and a half feet tall. And we can see that the shutter is open uh, on the dome and we can look out and peer into the universe. And lastly, uh, and certainly not least, 
we have our telescope. And uh, I'll let uh, one of the other uh, tour guides, uh, Patrick Newman, uh, talk about that now. Okay, thank you. It, uh, as you can see, we're now looking down the barrel of the telescope, where towards the center, you can see the primary mirror that is uh, 32 inches in diameter or 0.8 meters. Uh, you can see uh, also closer to us, the secondary mirror. And back down the primary mirror in the center, there's a hole. The way uh, this telescope operates is light comes through the front of the telescope, bounces off that primary, bounces again off secondary, and then comes down through that hole into a beam splitter where we can direct it to any of several different instruments. Okay, my uh, connection's being a bit laggy. Just bear with me. And uh, so uh, using that, we can uh, direct it to an eyepiece, a uh, low resolution spectrograph, and to a CCD where we do our science images. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic means that the eyepiece hasn't been able to get much use because, well, we want to keep people separated. So, uh, science imaging can continue more or less as normal. So Patrick, uh, could you explain yeah. uh, what it is we're uh, looking at and uh, what you're trying to do currently? Yeah. Uh, we're looking at uh, the main control software called the SkyX, which uh, uh, gives us this uh, planetarium-like interface where you can see the entire sky, uh, both above and below the horizon. We've also got uh, an effective horizon, the orange line, where if the telescope is pointed below that, it can't see outside the dome. That's about 15 degrees above the actual horizon. Uh, in general, we've got uh, all the constellations, uh, all of the brighter, better known stars, uh, a number of deep sky objects like uh, M33 and so on. Um, also uh, the planets, We'll be looking at uh, some of those uh, later tonight. Uh, what I'm intending to do is uh, get uh, the display moved over to uh, about 180 degrees from where it is right now so I can slew the telescope around to show us the back end of it where the instruments are. So you see a little bit about how they function. Um, fortunately, I'm getting so much lag that uh, the interface isn't really cooperating with me. Uh, so, uh, Will, could you do this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and just uh, as well as this uh, graphical display, there's also uh, a search functionality. So you can just type in object names or their coordinates and right ascension declination for looking at a specific patch of sky without uh, necessarily knowing what objects are there, which is pretty important for the research observing we're doing here because. Uh, often we get stars with just these catalog numbers that uh, are specific to the instrument that uh, was used to uh, suggest uh, that uh, they may have an exoplanet. And uh, so really we just need to plug in the right ascension declination to uh, do our follow-ups. Um, here you can see the side of the telescope that uh, it has this uh, fork mount that's uh, polar aligned so that it can track along with the sky. It's that just in principle makes the tracking simpler and so it can do more stuff with the hardware directly rather than not uh, fancy algorithms and software. You also see uh, a motor on one side with a transparent cover. So you can see some of the inner workings they don't show up too well at webcam resolutions. Yeah, you can see some of the instruments now attached to the back of the telescope coming into view.
that uh, uh, And yeah, you can also see the dome moving in the background since uh, it uh, tracks with the telescope. So when we point somewhere that we want to make sure we're actually looking out through the slit. Yeah, that'll work. So uh, you can see more or less towards the center, the beam splitter coming out of the hole in the back of the primary mirror. To the lower left is the eyepiece we have in here and which we'd love to show you the objects directly through, but again, given the pandemic, that's impractical. Okay. Uh, Patrick, uh, right quick, uh, if you could just yeah. give a quick uh, overview right quick of just the couple instruments sure. that we have available and then uh, some people are getting antsy, which is perfectly understandable. So we can go ahead ah. and move to uh, Saturn after this. Okay, uh, that uh, CCD is uh, more or less comparable to it your phone camera, except it skews towards a high resolution end at 16.8 megapixels. It also takes images only in uh, black and white that uh, by default, the pixels have this very broad sensitivity range of specific uh, red, green, blue pixels like your phone has. And we use a filter wheel attached to it to choose specific wavelengths that uh, in seven bands range from near infrared to near ultraviolet. And we do this uh, because uh, by ha being able to use all the pixels for a given wavelength, we can get uh, somewhat better resolution and our pixels are physically a bit larger than typical phone camera ones. So they're a bit less noisy. Okay, thank you, Patrick. So we're gonna be slewing to our first target of the night, which is Saturn. And we will have one of the other tour guides, uh, Ashley, uh, tell us all about Saturn uh, when we get there. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Ashley. I'll be one of your tour guides tonight. Um, in case any of you are any of you are interested, I'm also the secretary of the student organization photo, Friends of the Observatory. Um, so if you have any interest in looking at the telescope um, or uh, learning more about the taking care of the telescope, um, you can look us up on Mason 360 and um, we'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions about that later on. <laughs> but yeah. Let's see if the dome will move to the right spot. And um, as Patrick was saying, we will be seeing black and white images tonight. Uh, we're going to look at Saturn, uh, the Eagle Nebula, I believe the Ring Nebula, and there was one more. But we'll get to that in a little bit. First, we're gonna look at Saturn. Andromeda Galaxy. Um, uh, yes, thank you, the Andromeda Galaxy. All right. So yeah, here it comes. All right, so what you guys are looking at right now is our um, imaging software. Uh, the CCD is uh, Maxim DL Pro is the imaging software that we use. And what we do is we have a filter wheel that lets us pick um, uh, what kind of light we want to see the object in. And we also have uh, an exposure time so we can determine how much light we want to see from the object. And there's Saturn, yay! <laughs> so it does look very bright. That's because Saturn is one of the brighter objects in our night sky. So what we can do is we can play around with it a little bit here and um, see if we can bring out those um, really characteristic bands that make it so bright in the night sky. So as we're doing that, let me tell you a little bit about Saturn. Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun. And it is uh, one of our gas giants, Jupiter being the other one. And uh, Saturn is mostly made of hydrogen and helium. And um, it's, as a matter of fact, it's so, uh, it's very light. It's not very dense. It's so light that it could actually float in water if you had a body of water visible enough. Uh, but yeah, um, let's see, usually if you, yeah, here's Saturn's place. 
All right. So what you guys are looking at is Saturn with its rings. Its rings are mostly composed of water ice, rocky debris, and dust particles. Uh, those rings aren't actually solid, contrary to uh, what a lot of people think. If something were to fly through those, through those rings, it would disrupt them and um, kind of uh, leave a trail. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, one of the ideas behind why Saturn might have such a robust ring structure compared to other planets um, is that uh, some people believe that uh, maybe asteroids or moons may have been crushed over time and resulted in the large ring structure we have. Uh, Saturn actually, along with its rings, has more than 80 moons orbiting it. Uh, that includes uh, Titan and Enceladus. Titan and Enceladus are two of the more important of Saturn's moons. Uh, Titan is really, really cool because it's actually the largest of Saturn's moons, and it also has a substantial atmosphere. Um, surprisingly, uh, Titan actually has mostly a nitrogen atmosphere, which is very similar to the Earth, except it doesn't have quite, uh, it doesn't have quite a high oxygen content. So if we were to go there, we wouldn't be able to breathe there. But it also has uh, rivers, lakes, and seas of methane and ethane, which is really cool. It's the only, um, only plant, only moon in the solar system known to have those sorts of features. And a really, really cool fact about Titan is that um, if you had an oxygen, a way to, an oxygen mask or a way to breathe oxygen, and you also had a way to protect yourself from the bitter cold because it's so far away from the sun, you may actually be able to walk on Titan without a spacesuit. Uh, like I said, you'd need something to protect you from the bitter cold and you would need something uh, to breathe through. But um, its pressure is very similar to that of Earth. So it's pretty cool. And uh, its atmospheric pressure is pretty similar to that of Earth. So yeah, pretty cool in there. Uh, and then finally, Enceladus is the second most important of Saturn's moons. It's uh, very bright and shiny and reflective. Um, uh, the uh, recent Cassini mission actually uh, found that Enceladus was uh, coated in ice, and um, that ice could actually was actually the result of geysers that shoot water up from a subsurface ocean. And we can't see Enceladus right now. We'd probably have to do a little bit longer of an exposure time, but we don't. I don't think we'll. Someone might try to. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Enceladus is. Uh, has a subsurface ocean and it has geysers that shoot water into space and most of it falls back down to coat that really glossy surface. And some of it actually consider, can, contributes to Saturn's rings. So yeah, that is Saturn and its moons. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, Ashley, great. Uh, if you want to go ahead and move on to the second target uh, of the night, uh, we can go to the Eagle Nebula. All right, let's do that then. So what we have is IX in front of us, as was explained earlier. We're actually going to search for it. It can be, it's called M16. No, maybe not. Let's see if that takes us where we want to go. Let's try that. All right. While that's slewing, um, the reason I looked up M16 is because um, the Eagle Nebula is also called M16 and also called the Star Queen Nebula. Um, the reason it's called M16 is because um, a French, the French astronomer Charles Messier um, cataloged a number of uh, bright objects in the sky while he was looking for um, really, uh, I think we got a longer exposure time. So let me go ahead and do that. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about Charles Messier. And then we also do it. Okay. All right. So this takes a little bit longer of an exposure time because this is not in our uh, solar system. It's much further away. So you need to give it more time to um, uh, collect all that light coming into um, coming into the telescope. So yeah, back to Charles Messier. He is a French astronomer, and he cataloged a bunch of celestial objects in 1764. Uh, he wasn't the first to discover it, but he did catalog all these things. 
And um, one of them was M16, which we now know as the um, Eagle Nebula. Uh, some also refer to it as the Star Queen Nebula. It's very um, popular in popular culture. You'll see it all over the place if you ever look up um, any sort of space images online or if you're looking on Instagram or something, you probably see an image or two of um, portions of that nebula. Um, it also has, um, uh, so again, Messier, he was looking for actually comets and he actually came across these really bright objects and ended up cataloging a bunch of galaxies, a bunch of nebulae, and a bunch of globular clusters, even though he didn't quite know that at the time. Um, so yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about what a nebula is. Um, a nebula is um, a collection of gases and um, dust, space dust, that's all kind of clumped together. Uh, you have two types of nebulae, you have an emission nebulae and you have a dark nebulae. And um, the, emission, the emission nebulae, um, they actually shine with their own light because they're um, very bright and um, very active, so they're shining with their own light. And the dark nebulae don't shine, but they obscure light in a way that lets us see them kind of as these dark clouds. And hopefully you'll be able to see it with the image we get in a couple seconds. Um, I'm going to have to play around a little with the screen, uh, with the um, screen stretch that we have here that you see on the screen, see if I can um, uh, get, get some of those features out. Um, but yeah, uh, the Eagle Nebula is called the Eagle Nebula as kind of a nickname because um, it's kind of shaped like an eagle. All right. So actually, let's see if we can zoom in. Oh, look at that. That was beautiful. <laughs> That's wonderful. All right. Yes. So here is our beautiful Eagle Nebula. And as you can see, um, these dark uh, areas are um, dark nebulae, uh, dust clouds, and then the brighter areas are more um, emission nebulae. And you can see this feature right here in the middle is actually called the Pillars of Creation. Um, they're actually um, a, a stellar nursery uh, where uh, dust and uh, gas clouds are coming together to form um, a lot of stars and um, yeah, so that is the Eagle Nebula. Um, any questions on the Eagle Nebula so far? And I also want to point out it's kind of a combination of um, a globular cluster uh, plus all these gas clouds. So that's what kind of makes it uh, pretty unique. Um, yeah. Also, um, the pillars are actually uh, roughly four to five light years apart. Uh, so when you measure the size of this nebula, you'll be measuring it in quite a few light years. And the pillars are actually much, uh, very small, roughly in comparison to the whole nebula. So very, very large uh, celestial object. Okay, great. So yeah, this is a very amazing uh, view. Uh, so it's great to see something like this. And uh, as you pointed out earlier, Ashley, uh, we are looking at uh, the Pillars of Creation, which is I think one of the uh, better known uh, astronomy images. If you go to Google and you just type in Pillars of Creation, you get some really uh, beautiful and fantastic uh, colored images. And this is what that looks like uh, in black and white through our telescope. So wonderful. Uh, now we can have uh, Patrick, if you would like to go ahead and take us to the Ring Nebula and talk about that, that would be wonderful. Okay, so now we're going from uh, star birth to star death. We're uh, with uh, stars forming a nebula like that, when a star reaches the end of its uh, life, when it's uh, finished fusing all the hydrogen it's core into helium, it'll uh, swell up and become a red giant. If it's a star that's give or take uh, about the mass of the sun, 
it'll go through a few subsequent stages of fusing a shell of hydrogen and uh, the helium in the core will be fused to carbon and oxygen. These uh, last stages are actually uh, quite uh, unstable, start will pulsate and ultimately uh, puff off its outer layers forming a, a smallish nebula containing a significant fraction of the mass of the star. And uh, that is what we will be showing you. The run of the star as its outer layers are uh, floating away into the interstellar medium, uh, lit up by uh, what's uh, left of the core of the star, now a uh, white dwarf, uh, that is uh, extremely hot from the leftover heat from the fusion processes, but uh, has uh, uh, no more fusion going on, so it'll just slowly cool off over cosmic time scales as the outer layers just disperse. Uh, I believe our lecturer talked a little bit about white dwarfs, although uh, glossed over them about how they, they are very dense, but ultimately stable on their own. Okay, thanks Patrick. If uh, you're asked about the location of this object for lab purposes, it's in uh, the constellation Lyra. It's uh, not really overhead this late in the season. Uh, at this point in fall evening, it's starting to descend to the west, but uh, hasn't gone all the way yet. You know, while we're uh, waiting for the exposure to take, I'll just say a few facts about the observatory. Uh, you might notice it takes a little bit of time for the telescope to move between objects. Uh, and that's because it points incredibly precisely in the direction we want to look at. Uh, and it's, it's, it weighs several tons. So we're taking a telescope that weighs several tons and moving it um, with a precision that is, is hard to match. And to put things in perspective, this field of view that you're looking at right now on the screen is less than the size of a full moon. Uh, and the detail you see here is equivalent to being able to see um, individual hairs uh, taped to, uh, say, a blackboard at the front of a large lecture hall when you're standing from the back of a la large lecture hall. So it's, a, it's really neat to, to see um, the telescope uh, to be able to point as precisely as that to give us these crisp images of our night sky. It's also big to gather more light from the telescope so that we can see these very faint objects that we're so showing you. Uh, uh, the Eagle Nebula, for example, is not something you can see with the unaided eye, uh, even in a dark sky location. And so I'll give it back to Patrick. Okay, uh, now the nebula has come into view. Um, I apologize for the extra sky brightness. Uh, see that uh, uh, here you can see the why it's called a uh, ring nebula, given this approximate ring shape. Although it's also somewhat distorted from that and. There are, uh, yeah, additional features that aren't really showing up at this uh, resolution. That, uh, well, it looks relatively small here. It's approximately two and a half light years across because we're viewing a uh, nebula that's about 2,300 light years away. So this gets us into the few arc second range. 
Uh, families looking closely at what I did with the filter wheel, that while we have technically a shorter exposure here, we're using a much uh, wider filter because this is a relatively faint object, about ninth magnitude. So faint enough that it does need a telescope. You may have heard that it's called a planetary nebula, that uh, that's uh, not because of anything to do with plants, but because uh, when you're working with a small telescope like was available in the 1600s or 1700s, you see this object that looks vaguely like a planet, though much fainter, and it doesn't move uh, around the sky the way uh, an actual planet does. So it's something different, but looks similar. So they gave it a name that represents that similarity. Um, let's see. That uh, this uh, black and white image is actually surprisingly representative of what you'd see if you're looking th at uh, the nebula directly. That uh, in general, it tends to look gray through an eyepiece or maybe somewhat uh, greenish, depending on the telescope, how sensitive your eyes are because the nebula itself uh, puts out a fair amount of light in the green and your eyes are particularly sensitive there. Um, let's see, are there any questions about uh, M57 or? It looks like that? there's a dot kind of in the middle of the ring nebula, what's that? <laughs> that is a star that's there to uh, trick you <laughs> that uh, that is not the white dwarf in the center, but it's a background star that's located in a pretty close to the same position. Uh, the actual white dwarf is uh, substantially uh, fainter. I believe it's like on the order of uh, 15th or 16th magnitude visually. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Patrick. And next up, uh, we have, uh, I believe, the last target uh, of the evening, which is the Andromeda Galaxy. So we'll have Andrew uh, take it away from here. All right, so are we gonna slew over right to the galaxy right now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so while that's happening, I'll let you guys know a little bit about the Andromeda Galaxy. So the Andromeda Galaxy is actually one of our nearest uh, galactic neighbors. It's about two and a half million light years away. So even going at light speed, basically the universe's speed limit, as we know it so far, it'll still take two and a half million light years to get there. But in terms of outer space, that's really not that far. Um, and it's actually absolutely huge. The galaxy is pretty big. Um, it's about 220,000 light years across, while our galaxy is about 100 light years, or sorry, 100,000 light years, excuse me, across. So it's about uh, twice the diameter. And it's also very numerous in stars. So both of our galaxies have tons of stars. They have about a trillion stars. We have about four and a half billion, or I'm sorry, 250 billion stars. Um, but we can throw around numbers all day, but it's really hard to put into perspective, really imagine how big those numbers are. So if you can imagine counting each star one by one in either galaxy, um, it would take a few thousand years to count all of them if you're just gonna do it one second at a time. I think three, about 3,000 years for our galaxy and about four times as much, about 12,000 years to count all the stars in the Andromeda galaxy. So that is tons and tons of stars. Um, but despite both of, those gal both of our galaxies looking pretty numerous in stars, it's really only because when you, when, you, when you have enough of a field of view to look at each galaxy, there's so much saturation of the stars um, it looks like it's very dense, but it's actually really not. Um, so for example, our solar system, if you were to shrink it down to about the size of a football field, uh, these are rough estimates, by the way, um, our planet would be about the size of a grain of salt. So that's, and the rest of it is basically empty space all the way out to the outer part of the football field where Pluto is. And then roughly the next nearest solar system to us would be about the distance uh, we are now to California. So that's basically the rest of the galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy as well. So there's just so much empty space um, when they collide in the future. The, right now they're on a collision course that's expected to happen in about four and a half, five billion years. Uh, there's really not going to be a whole lot going on in terms of uh, colliding stars or star systems, even though that's what um, some people might expect. 
with huge galaxies full of stars. There's just so much space in between them. Um, and even when that does happen, we won't be here to see it. Our star is expected to burn out in about 5 billion years and our star and our planet will become much less habitable in a lot less time than that. So it's really nothing to worry about. Um, um, so uh, there's actually been recent studies that the Andromeda galaxy is actually maybe not as massive as we once thought. Uh, maybe it might not be as obvious or evident because it has a lot to do with dark matter. So dark matter is unlike baryonic matter, which is what you and I are made of. It's not really, it's not undetectable. We just know that it exists because of the influence that things have around it. And we, our galaxy proportionately has a lot more, is expected to have a lot more dark matter than the Andromeda galaxy as of recent studies from about 2018, 2017 or so. Um, so that would make our galaxies closer in mass uh, to each other. And for those who don't really know what dark matter is, it's basically kind of like an undetectable glue that holds galaxies uh, together. So when simulations are run, uh, gravity does not account for all of the effects of galaxies and stars being held together in, in, a, in just one huge mass at great distances. Um, just gravity is not expected to be strong enough to be able to do that, to be able to pull off a feat like that on its own. So um, that's where the theory of dark matter comes in, where, there's, where scientists and researchers think that there's this stronger influence that's holding it together. And that could be giving us more mass than expected compared to the Andromeda galaxy. So I thought that's pretty cool. Um, pretty cool stuff. A lot of recent research going on in uh, our galaxies. So are we slewing over right now to the Andromeda galaxy? So yes, this is uh, the Andromeda galaxy in a sense. Uh, so this is uh, one of the joys of uh, doing uh, observations. Uh, interesting stuff like this can happen. Uh, it looks like uh, we just uh, caught the telescope kind of moving here uh, somehow. So let's just go ahead and take uh, another exposure so you can see all of these uh, streaks. And each of those streaks uh, should be stars. So it looks like we were just uh, exposing somehow and the telescope uh, moved uh, a little bit. Yeah, this looks like the telescope jumped a little bit in right ascension. Um, and there's a little bit of motion uh, up and down as well. And that uh, well, it's actually not a bad view, but it'll improve uh, somewhat uh, once we get this next exposure out. But looks, yeah, that's an artifact of the telescope moving. Now that may look like a quite a large move of the telescope, but it was probably about um, what we call 15 arc seconds, which is uh, about one quarter of one sixtieth of a degree, uh, so quite the the small uh, small change, uh, but nonetheless, that's enough to uh, uh, ruin our particular field of view. And here comes the next exposure, much better. Back to you. Great, thank you. So if I can just. Uh, fiddle with this a little bit. So we have the Andromeda galaxy nice and bright in the center here. If I can just zoom in on it. So Andrew, uh, I'm not sure if there's uh, anything else you want to add uh, to the uh, Andromeda Galaxy talk. Um, that's basically all the most information to me, at least for now. But if anybody has any questions about it, um, they can comment it below and I might be able to answer some of them.
Yeah, you can see some of the dust lanes now um, in the, uh, the, and we would need a longer exposure to see some of these. Uh, it's kind of neat to think about the, the light we're seeing here. It's uh, the light of hundreds of millions of stars that have traveled three million years uh, to get to our sensor tonight on the campus telescope. So this is the downtown Andromeda where the density of stars is highest and we, they're very bright. And in fact, we could change the stretch here and kind of show you just how bright the core is compared to the rest of the galaxy. But as we adjust how the intensity of light is displayed on the screen, uh, we can bring out some more of the detail and you can start to see some uh, dust lanes uh, in the disk of the galaxy um, uh, uh, around it. And we could do, a, we're doing a longer exposure now, right now to bring out some more of that detail. While we're waiting for the exposure to finish, I'll just toss out uh, some uh, factoids. I'd like to, to let you know that Andromeda, you can actually see it with your unaided eye, that very bright core. It looks like a little fuzzy blob. Um, it's, it's the only object outside uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, besides the large and small Magellanic clouds, that is visible to the unaided eye. But you can't see it from Fairfax, Virginia. You have to go to uh, one of the um, darkest uh, sites in the country uh, to, to get a good look at it. A uh, couple other uh, fun facts. I just wanted to thank our speaker, uh, Gorgian, um, for, for joining us tonight and giving us a wonderful talk on black holes. In two weeks, our speaker will be Dr. Jesse Christensen uh, from the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute, and that'll be on October 22nd. Our um, talk in November will be Dr. Luisa Rabul, also from Caltech, uh, to talk about her work on young stars. So we've got a wonderful lineup for you over the coming uh, month. And uh, here we are. Here comes the next view of the Andromeda Galaxy. And that should be our last view of the night. And then we will uh, call the night. Oh, our telescope jumped again. Look at that. Uh, we're going to have to do it again. Sorry about that. Uh, while that's waiting, I'll, I'll go ahead and adjust the, the view here. Um, I guess, William, I'll, I'll take control for a second to try and uh, bring out some of that detail. But unfortunately, our, uh, our um, telescope did, did have a little bit of a glitch uh, during those two minutes. And so we'll, we'll do one more uh, exposure. That uh, kind of stinks, but that is what it is. And we'll wait for that to run out. I'd like to thank all of you for joining. Uh, you're welcome to sign off now at this point, if, if, uh, uh, but you're also welcome to stick around for uh, just another minute to get a good look uh, at this exposure. So we're collecting all the data from this light that has traveled uh, for 3 million uh, light years distance to, to get to us. Uh, this talk will be posted to YouTube on the observatory website. And we'll also, if you scroll up in the chat, there's a link to a survey that I ask that you fill out uh, for joining us tonight. I will try and copy and paste that one more time. Here we go. There it is. If you could fill that out, let us know how you found out about our uh, evening under stars, tell your friends uh, and invite them to come in two weeks uh, for our next event. Almost there. Here we go. Hopefully the telescope didn't jump a second time uh, or a third time as it were. Oh no, okay. 
Well, we'll call it a night here uh, and uh, we'll try to figure out what's going on there. Let me take a look and make sure we're tracking. We are tracking, uh, but we will call it a night. We'll do one more exposure, but thank you for joining us tonight. Anyone that wants to stay on for the last exposure is welcome to um, and have a good night. Thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you uh, to Justin, William, our observatory graduate student TAs, uh, the deputy director, Dr. Rob Parks, and our tour guides tonight, Patrick Newman, Ashley Mertzok, Andrew Siddle, and uh, Brandon Toth uh, for uh, guiding us through the night sky tonight. And anyone else I uh, forgot, I apologize. Um, and here we are. Does anyone have any questions at this point in time that they've been waiting to ask? Is this a Stephanie Blake that I know? I don't know if Stephanie's still on the line. Now Stephanie left. <laughs> okay, just a few more, about 30 more seconds. Uh, that's one of the perils of taking a long exposure. We could zoom in and just show you some of these little star trails here. Uh, and you can see that the star kind of wiggled a little bit as the telescope moved. Here we go, two minute exposure. Fingers crossed. And success, that's a beautiful image. Look at that one. Uh, so now we can see much more detail on the, on the dust lanes um, around um, the core downtown Andromeda. And uh, we see some of these kind of dark lanes um, uh, showing uh, the, um, the, the, the dust lanes in the spiral arms of the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy is a spiral galaxy like uh, the Milky Way. Um, uh, except we're outside the Andromeda galaxy. It's a little hard to see the dust lanes in our own Milky Way galaxy because we're inside of it. Uh, but this is a really nice view. You still see that bright core is still there. Um, and then as we kind of bring that contrast up and, and saturate that core, we can see the, the finer detail uh, out in those dust lanes. And those are just, those are just beautiful. Uh, and so those are, um, might, you might ask, what is dust? What is a dust lane? Uh, those are basically what we're seeing is the light from stars being blocked by um, tiny particles, actually smoke-like particles of solids, um, about one micron, one one millionth of a meter, but there's so much of it in interstellar space from the life cycle of stars uh, that it's enough to block the light of the, of the, of the stars in this galaxy. So, Thank you all for joining us. I will turn it back to William and Justin to, to uh, close up the telescope. Thank you for joining us tonight and uh, keep enjoying the clear skies, the clear winter skies. Take a look up, get a telescope of your own, and we'll hopefully see you again in two more weeks. Thank you all. <laughs>